This is the Insurance Law Podcast, brought to you by Best Directory of Recommended Insurance Attorneys. Welcome to the Insurance Law Podcast, the broadcast about timely and important legal issues affecting the insurance industry. I'm John Zuba, Managing Editor of Best Directory of Recommended Insurance Attorneys. We're pleased to have with us today attorneys Jason Taylor and Jeremy Macklin from the law firm of Traub, Lieberman, Strauss, and Shrewsbury, LLP, with offices in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Illinois, California, Florida, and London. Jason Taylor is a senior associate with the firm. He's in the Chicago office where he concentrates his practice in the areas of insurance coverage, excess monitoring, professional liability, and general liability. Jason primarily represents insurance companies in complex claims, disputes, and declaratory judgment actions encompassing both first and third party coverage disputes involving primary and excess liability policies. Jason may be contacted at jtaylor at travelieberman.com. Jeremy Macklin is a senior associate with the firm where he practices in the firm's insurance coverage group also in Chicago. Jeremy represents insurance and provides coverage advice on a wide range of commercial lines policies including liability policies, property policies, and excess insurance policies. His coverage experience includes policy interpretation, extra contractual liability issues, and litigation of declaratory judgment actions. And Jeremy may be contacted at jmacklin at traublieberman.com. Today's topic is cannabis insurance coverage and the impact on the insurance industry. And Jason, we're going to start out with you today. Can you tell us what the current status of marijuana legalization is and why is this issue important to insurance carriers? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, John, first of all, for, for having us on. It's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, legalization of marijuana, whether for recreational medical purposes, uh, it, it's such an is- interesting issue. It's, it's so new. Uh, within the last few months, we've had um, the 24th and 25th states legalize medical marijuana. The most recent two were uh, both Pen- with Pennsylvania and Ohio. Uh, in addition, four states, Washington, Colorado, Oregon, Alaska, and the District of Columbia have legalized marijuana for recreational use. And coming up here in November, we've got another nine states, I believe it is, the last count that has medical marijuana on the ballot or in a legislative initiative, and then another five that are uh, seeking to legalize marijuana at the recreational level. So uh, we're sort of at a tipping point here. We've got about half the states um, that have legalized medical marijuana in some form or another, and potentially by the end of the year, you know, a a very large swath of states that will have uh, recreational marijuana. And this is important, of course, because of money, uh, like anything, right? Um, the market and the size of the industry is just is, is really staggering for how new it is. And uh, we've seen differing statistics, but by, say, 2020 or in the next couple years here, uh, there's, there's estimates out there that the market will be something like $20 billion. Um, so that, that could even be higher. So really large, and in this kind of market, this sort of exploding market, uh, you can imagine there's numerous businesses uh, requiring new or specialized or additional insurance to cover uh, cannabis and related operations. And Jason, what is the Controlled Substances Act, or CSA, and what does that mean for individuals and for businesses? Yeah, sure. The uh, Controlled Substances Act is is the federal law that sets out uh, U.S. drug policy and regulates the manufacturing, possession, use, distribution of of drugs and other substances. So uh, drugs and other substances, chemicals to make drugs, are classified into five schedules from one to five. Uh, Marijuana is in the Schedule I classification, which is the highest and most dangerous class of drugs. Uh, You know, we're talking about drugs like LSD, heroin, ecstasy, the the really bad ones, right? So um, Schedule I drugs are, are typically defined as having a high potential for abuse, uh, can can lead to psychological or physical dependence and no currently accepted medical use. So that's that's where uh, marijuana has been scheduled. Um, what this really means for the rest of us is that it's illegal to possess, distribute, or use marijuana for any purpose under federal law. And that's that's regardless of what the states uh, have done with either medical or recreational use. So um, in general, you know, federal law will trump state law. So anytime you're you're using or distributing or selling medical marijuana, say, uh, even if it's legal under the state level, you're, you're violating federal law. So uh, this conflict between state law and federal law, the Controlled Substances Act, and, and how the federal government is going to enforce the Controlled Substances Act is, is really the big issue here for business and insurers. And Jeremy, what are some of the common features of medical marijuana statutes? All right, I'm going to address two common features. First, there is gener- generally a specific class of individuals to whom protections are afforded. And by protections, I mean immunity from arrest, criminal prosecution, property forfeiture, 
penalties and things of that nature. So, for example, New Mexico and Illinois have statutes um, that afford protections to registered qualifying patients, registered designated caregivers, physicians, registered cultivation centers, and registered dispensing organizations. Um, Second, there is a group of the qualifying patients, they also must be suffering from one or more qualifying conditions. And so the list of qualifying conditions varies from statute to statute. Second, some statutes contain provisions relating to marijuana use at the workplace and employer protections. Uh, For example, Ohio and Illinois medical marijuana statutes provide that nothing in the statute shall prohibit an employer from enforcing a policy concerning drug testing or zero tolerance policies. Um, There are other states that prohibit employers from firing medical marijuana users for failing a drug test without evidence of impairment on the job. So medical marijuana statutes are generally lengthy, but these are two common provisions that should be identified uh, by any attorney seeking to represent a client who is a medical marijuana user. And Jason, what are the insurance risks associated with the cannabis industry and legalization of medical and recreational marijuana? Uh, well, as you can imagine, there's, there are some particular risks to the cannabis industry, and that, that goes beyond just maybe your typical uh, property coverage or, or third-party liability coverage uh, you know, from a general business operations standpoint. Uh, for example, products liability and food safety are, are, are some big ones here. The marijuana itself, once it's, it's harvested, is a product, right? You sell it. Uh, there have already been cases alleging some kind of injury or, or adverse effect from uh, the use of, of the product. Um, either against a grower or retailers. Um, these can come in the forms of improper labeling um, or, you know, the use of certain prohibited fungicides or pesticides in growing the crop. Um, edibles and infused products, you may have heard about these are sort of the, the, the products that you ingest that contain, you know, THC. It's probably the fastest growing sector out there. And, and we're, we're starting to see now claims uh, against these companies, these, these businesses, um, for some kind of adverse reaction or inadvertent side effect, and, and that's really sort of your essential products liability claim, uh, either a failure to warn or improper labeling or something of those that nature. And, and a lot of states require um, cannabis businesses to, to maintain and, and procure coverage. Washington and Colorado are, are example. Uh, professional liability coverage is another specialized area of need. Uh, medical malpractice insurance for physicians, for example. Uh, they evaluate patients and recommend marijuana. Uh, dispensaries are, are sort of in, in that same boat, some, some professional liability concerns there. They're responsible oftentimes for validating and tracking medical marijuana cards. And, and you know, this will create a risk for the dispensary to, to properly uh, do that, to validate those individuals that come into their facilities uh, to purchase marijuana. If you go to sort of maybe a more traditional property side, premises liability and theft coverage, are big issues. Most of these businesses still operate as, as really cash-only businesses due to lack of uh, accessible banking. So you have a situation where you've got a highly valuable, small, portable product and large amounts of cash. Uh, so it makes the cannabis businesses prime targets for, say, theft or um, you know employee theft even from both outsiders and employees. So business, businesses need substantial insurance to protect uh, from these risks. And, and I'll just identify one, one last one here. Um, it's a, kind of a growing concern nationally. It's uh, cyber liability coverage, data breach, uh, data theft coverage uh, for mishandling patient and customer information. These businesses are, are dealing with a uh, large number of patients. Uh, a lot of them you know, have serious medical conditions, and they're providing all sorts of um, patient and personal information. And so it makes the cyber risk a, a real risk for the industry. And, and uh, something that uh, the cannabis industry is, is likely to need uh, sort of specialized uh, coverage for. Uh, these are just a few. Uh, of course, there are probably many uh, specialized areas, but uh, those are the ones that uh, kind of jump out here. Now, Jeremy, is there any case law or are there any decisions out there that impact insurance carriers or provide some type of guidance to the insurance industry? Sure. Uh, mo- most of the cases in the, the 2000s and the early 2010s have addressed whether workers' compensation insurers are obligated to provide coverage for medical marijuana legally prescribed under state law, and also in the employer's liability context where an employer can legally terminate an employee who tests positive for medical marijuana while at work. But there's a recent case, uh, it's a federal case out of the 
U.S. District Court for the District of Colorado, which was handed down, handed down in February of this year. And that provides some guidance to insurance companies on issues of insurance coverage. Uh, so that case is captioned Green Earth Wellness Center versus Attain Specialty Insurance Company. Uh, I'll briefly just go through some of the important facts and uh, a couple of the takeaways there. Uh, the insured in that case was Green Earth, and they operated a they still operate a re- retail medical marijuana dispensary in a nearby growing facility. Uh, Green Earth purchased commercial property and commercial liability coverage from Attain in connection with its business operation. So, of course, a wildfire in Colorado impacted Green Earth's business. Uh, the specific claim was that smoke and ash from the fire overwhelmed the building's ventilation system and caused damage to Green Earth's medical marijuana plants. The opinion is long, but there are a few important takeaways. Uh, First, rather than applying federal law, the case was pending in a federal jurisdiction, the court applied the law of the state in which the lawsuit was brought, so in this case, Colorado. And I I think this is important because the court did not apply federal law to find that the insurance policy was void on grounds of illegality. For example, a contract governing an illegal activity, which is illegal under federal law, Uh, the court expressly rejected Green Earth's argument that its own policy was illegal. So I think that's important. And the second takeaway, um, the court also considered whether marijuana was contraband under a contraband exclusion. Um, The court looked to what they called conflicting signals that the federal government has given regarding marijuana regulation and the government's quote-unquote ambivalence towards enforcement of the Controlled Substances Act. So this is important because it showed a it showed the diminished importance of the Controlled Substance Act to courts, um, which is in line with this the Cole memo that ca- the Coleman memo that came out in uh, 2013, and that's important because it shows a a sign that liability and property policies can be interpreted to provide coverage for marijuana activities, despite the fact that the activities are illegal currently under federal law. So again, the case is much more complex and nuanced than what I've explained today, but in the short time we have, I believe that these are the two most prominent points from that February decision. And uh, Jeremy, can you tell us what rules apply to attorneys trying to advise and assist those connected to the cannabis industry? Absolutely. I think that the main rule to focus on here is Rule 1.2D of the Model Rules of Professional Conduct, which have been uh, applied uh, substantially in a similar fashion to the model rules by many states. And that rule allows an attorney to provide services that are strictly advisory regarding the validity, scope, meaning of law, but also at the same time precludes that attorney from assisting clients from from breaking the law or advising clients to commit fraudulent or criminal acts. So attorney, an attorney representing a client connected to the cannabis industry in a state where medical and or recreational marijuana are legal, maybe in violation of federal law, um, depending on the scope of the representation, and therefore uh, faces a, uh, a question, am I violating Rule 1.2D um, with respect to the prohibition against advising and counseling a client regarding criminal or fraudulent acts? Um, so jurisdictions where medical and marijuana, medical and or recreational marijuana is legal have taken different approach, approaches for providing attorneys with guidance as to how Rule 1.2D can be interpreted. Um, For example, in October of 2015, Illinois amended its version of 1.2D to provide that a lawyer can counsel or assist a client in conduct expressly permitted by Illinois law that may violate or conflict with federal law so long as the lawyer advises the client about um, the federal law and its potential consequences. And Hawaii took a similar position. Uh, They did that through its Supreme Court ruling, um, which is, I believe, back in um, 2013 as well. Um, Then you have some states such as Arizona and California where the Rule 1.2D has not been expressly amended, but um, state bars have set forth what they're calling memoranda or opinions, which provide some guidance as to how the attorneys are supposed to to act. Um, And those opinions have said that these attorneys can uh, can represent ethically a, a marijuana-based business um, under the Rule 1.2, at least as those state bars have have interpreted the rule. And finally, you, there are certain jurisdictions such as Maine that have amended Rule 1.2 
to expressly preclude attorneys from representing cannabis-related businesses uh, on the basis that the, the proposed client is known to be in violation of the federal criminal law. So in some, the, the takeaway is really that lawyers should engage in a case-by-case analysis of the jurisdiction and, and the scope of the desired representation to determine whether taking on the client is ethical. Jason and Jeremy, thank you both for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you. We've spoken with attorneys Jason Taylor and Jeremy Macklin from the law firm of Traub, Lieberman, Strauss, and Shrewsbury, LLP. Special thanks to today's producer, John Weber. And thank you all for joining us for the Insurance Law Podcast. To subscribe to this audio program, go to iTunes or our webpage, www.ambest.com slash directories. If you have any suggestions for a future topic regarding an insurance law case or issue, please email us at lawpodcast at ambest.com. I'm John Zuba, and now this message. Best's directory of recommended insurance attorneys is used by decision makers at insurance companies responsible for selecting legal counsel and representation. The printed directory is distributed annually to insurance companies, non-insurance companies, third-party administrators, and corporate counsel around the world, and the online edition is accessible throughout the year. Your listing in Best's directory of recommended insurance attorneys is the most effective way to ensure that thousands of potential clients have access to your outstanding credentials. Here's why you should be listed in the number one insurance insurance attorney reference. Your firm's credentials will be listed in our comprehensive reference guide, which is made available to thousands of insurance professionals globally, both in print and online. AMBEST listees are recognized as the most qualified in their field to represent the unique needs of insurance companies. Key decision makers rely on the directory to take the guesswork out of their selection process. They know that only the best are listed, those firms with a proven track record of excellence who are recommended by their insurance industry clients. And remember, one low rate guarantees year long visibility for your firm. We invite you to use our web application process to apply for a listing today. With our reasonable rates and broad exposure, there's no more effective way to get the attention of the insurance industry. For more information about Best's Directory of Recommended Insurance Attorneys, visit www.insuranceattorneysearch.com.